Welcome back to our series on linear regression models inside of Python. So in our last video, uh, we kind of introduced what a linear regression model is. We talked a little bit about machine learning, and then we also uh, got started building our model. And the first part of building any type of model is loading the data into Python and then doing just a couple transformations, some checks to make sure that everything looks correct and uh, uh, basically, you know, setting the stage for doing kind of the next couple steps. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to actually explore our data a little bit. This is always a very, very important part when it comes to any type of modeling is you want to really get a good sense of what the data looks like um, and really kind of help direct you in the sense of what kind of questions you should answer or really also helping you answer the question of, is there any more transformations that I have to do, um, especially when it comes to outliers, how skewed the data is, um, things along that nature. That That's really why we do this step is because it's making sure that when we run our model, uh, we're using the right metrics and that we're also making sure that the data we're passing through actually you know, makes sense and, and really can help us answer our hypothesis. So the first thing that I always like to do <clears throat> once I have my data all transformed and stuff like that is I actually like to plot it. In this particular type of model, a scatter plot works beautifully just because there's one variable on the axis and then another variable on the other axes. And that is great for trying to help us understand if there's a relationship at play. It doesn't answer the question as necessarily if that you know relationship truly does exist, but at least it kind of helps set the stage of, okay, well, at least it looks like we're heading down the right direction. So well, how to build a scatter plot is we're going to need our x coordinates and our y coordinates. In this example, our x coordinate is simply going to be um, our exon price. <clears throat> so the price of a single exon share at any given point in time. And then our y coordinate is going to be uh, the price of a barrel of oil at any given point in time. Um, and then once we have those two series object, because that's basically what these are, these are going to be some panda series, uh, we can create a scatter plot. And so what I like to do is I'll call my plot library, and then we'll call the plot method. Uh, I'll pass through my x coordinates and my y coordinates. I'll uh, pick a, a marker. In this case, I want it to be circles. And then I'll pick a color. Uh, in this case, I want cadet blue. I like doing more you know, unique colors, not just blue or something like that. And then I'm also going to want a label. And this label is really going to come in handy when we need to have a legend in our particular scatter plot. So right here, this is just kind of creating our plot object. There's some extra formatting I like to do. I always like to make sure that um, my charts have a title. So I want mine to be Exxon uh, versus oil. I also like to make sure there are, is an X label and a Y label and making sure that it's clear uh, which one is which. Uh, so this one I want to uh, plot the X label to be X on. And then I also want my Y label to be um, oil. Actually, sorry about that. I actually misspelled those. And then uh, what we'll put here is this will be oil. And then we also want to make sure that we have a legend. And this is more just for demonstration purposes so they understand that, hey, it's, it's a price value. You don't technically have to put it, but I just like to be really clear. And so what this does is it creates a nice little scatter plot for us where we now have oil on our Y axis and then Exxon Mobil on our X axis. We have our title. And really what this is kind of telling to me is it looks like there actually is a, is a decent correlation at least. And really what it's saying is it looks like there's a positive correlation here. So we can clearly tell that, you know, as my price of oil goes up, it, it definitely looks like my Exxon Mobile uh, stock is also going up as well. So there, there appears to be a relationship. Um, I don't think at this point anything's kind of popped out that says, wait a minute, something's going wrong or, you know, blah, 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 something like that. Um, it looks like there's something here. So I think it's definitely valid to keep going forward in the process. Um, what I would probably want to do is actually measure this correlation and really just put a number behind it. What am I looking at um, and how? what should I kind of categorize it as? Well, luckily for us, inside of Pandas, we can always just call our, our data frame and then we can call the correlation method. And this is great. What it returns back to us is another data frame, which is basically a correlation matrix. And so it's basically saying here, what's the correlation between Exxon and Exxon? 
Well, it should be one because they're the same exact thing. So they should basically be landing on top of each other. The ones that we're really concerned with is what's the correlation between the, the price of oil and the price of Exxon? And what it's returning back to us is 0 0.60. That's actually a pretty strong relationship. In fact, we're really kind of at the brink of what we would consider a strong relationship. And so what we're saying here is there definitely seems to be something worthwhile here. Um, we can always do a little bit more further exploration and see, you know, really does this kind of make sense? And we'll see down the road with our hypothesis testing, you know, whether we can say kind of with confidence that maybe there is a relationship there. So really all we did at this point is we, we wanted to visualize this relationship between these two variables and then really assign a number behind it. So that way we can kind of say, hey, this is what it's looking like as a relationship. Um, so once I've done that, usually what I'll do next is I like to just have a nice little summary of my data because what it does, it, it just kind of helps pin a, you know, paint a nice uh, picture where we can kind of clearly see what are the key metrics and things along that nature. And again, pandas makes this so easy. All we have to do is we just have to call the describe method. And what it does is again, it, it populates a new data frame for us where each column <clears throat> is the data. And then we have the different metrics for those particular columns. So what it's telling me here is that I do have about 1,248 records of data. The mean for Exxon is 84, while for oil it's 61. I get a standard deviation for each one. I get a min and a max, so the minimum value it found and the maximum value. And then, you know, 25% of the values is, you know, above this, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And so really what I try to look at this one is, is there potentially any outliers? <laughs> and really when we look at this, I, I did the calculations behind the scenes, but really everything falls within three standard deviations. So there doesn't really appear to be any outliers, at least at this point. Um, so I kind of feel comfortable going forward in the process to kind of say, you know, it doesn't seem like there's anything that's kind of uh, concerning me at this point um, that potentially might be any outliers or things along that nature. So uh, definitely you should use the describe method to kind of create that summary because that's really going to kind of help dictate going forward when you're looking for outliers and things like skewness. And so that kind of leads us to our next little section. Uh, we do want to check and see if there are any outliers and we do want to check if there's any skewness to our data because if there's skewed data, um, we might have to transform our data to make it more uh, normal-like in the sense of it follows more of a normal distribution. Um, and then if there's, <clears throat> it can also help in a sense with the outlier aspect. So uh, there's two metrics that we're going to really use here. One is kurtosis. So that's really going to help us to understand if there's any outliers and then there's skewness. So um, is our data a little bit more to the positive side or the negative side? And, and really what are the implications of that? But before I actually do that, as, as I actually do want to make sure that we plot each data set, um, and I like to plot it as a histogram. And so we'll do a grid, sorry, we'll do a histogram method. And then what we'll do is I don't like to have the grids on my chart. So I'm going to set that grid equal to false. And again, I want some color behind it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, give it a uh, cadet blue. And what this will do is it will uh, create two histograms, one for each column of data. You know, looking at this, I don't really see any outliers per se, but I will kind of say it looks slightly skewed. But again, I would like a number behind that. I don't want to just visually look at it and say, oh, yeah, that definitely looks skewed and, you know, stop here. At this point, I think it makes sense to check, you know, and making sure that there actually is, um, you know, either significant skew or if there's kurtosis or things along that nature. So what we'll do is we'll calculate the excess kurtosis using the Fisher method. Uh, and this is actually going to go right back to the libraries up here. So the SciPy libraries, these have some great um, metrics that we can use when it comes to calculating kurtosis and skew. And so what we'll do is we'll create a new variable called exon kurtosis. <clears throat> and then we'll call the kurtosis method. And then we'll do price data. And then we'll do exon underscore price. And then we want to specify the Fisher method. Um, 
and we want that to be equal to true. With the Fisher method, we want our kurtosis to be closer to zero. If we use Pearson, we want our kurtosis to be closer to three. Um, with Pearson, uh, a kurtosis of three is more normal-like, and then with a Fisher, excess kurtosis of zero is more normal-like. And so what I'll do is I'll copy this one, and then I'll call this one oil kurtosis, and then this one will use the oil price. And then what I'll do from here is I'll calculate the exon skew. And then this is pretty much almost identical. In fact, I can copy that. And then I'll just change some stuff. I'll change this to the skew metric. And then I'll just remove that Fisher parameter because it doesn't take, well, it takes some parameters, but not ones that we're concerned with. And then again, uh, we'll do it for the oil one. And there we go. And then we'll do oil price. <clears throat> and then from here, I definitely want to make sure we can display it. So we'll display um, exon kurtosis. And then I'll put a little placeholder. And then I'll do brackets, colon two. This will round it to two decimal places. And then I'll call the format method. Uh, and then we'll say exon kurtosis. And then from here, I'll copy this. And then I'll put oil kurtosis, oil kurtosis. And that's actually lowercase. And then I'll copy these two. And then I'll do the same thing for the skew. Uh, I'm just going to change some stuff. So this will be skew. And then this will be skew. And then this will be skew. And then finally, this will be skew. Okay, let's run it. <clears throat> okay, so kurtosis. For the most part, both of these are fine. Uh, usually, I put a little down here. If you get anything between negative one to negative one half or between one half to positive one, it's moderately skewed or sorry, my bad. Uh, if you get this approximately to zero, it's if it's a little bit, if it's less than zero or it's greater than zero, um, these are kind of the meanings behind it. Most people consider that, you know, as long as this is kind of within one or something like that, that it's usually good to go. Um, so in this case, it's fine. And really what this is telling us is there's no outliers with our skew. Uh, that's a little bit more of a different problem. <laughs> With the uh, with, with this one, it, it, it's basically saying this one is fine for the most part. It's it's moderately skewed. This is kind of right at that cutoff point where um, basically what it's telling us is, you know, if it was a little bit higher, we might have to do something. Um, actually, I just realized that it's not rounding it like I was expecting it to. But when I run it again, it's basically at that cutoff point. Most people would say, you know, once you run into one, uh, you might need to do some transformations. Uh, some people will even say it's a little bit higher. I've seen some people say lower. It's very subjective <laughs> sometimes. So you just got to keep in mind, you know, if it's if it's significantly skewed, then what you might have to do is like a log transformation just to make sure your data is a little bit um, more normal-like. <clears throat> but for the most part, I'm usually fine with this. And this is really just more impacting um, the linear regression model when it comes to the hypothesis testing um, for the actual model itself, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, I do like to do these metrics because it, again, it kind of just validates my results a little bit more. Um, and it's kind of just saying that, hey, you know, this is kind of what I'm looking at. And, you know, everything seems to be kind of playing the same. What you could technically do is too, is if you wanted, you could actually perform a kurtosis and a skew test, but you got to be a little bit careful with one of these. So what I'll do is we'll actually do a, a kurtosis test and a skew test, and we'll do it with Exxon and I think oil as well. But if I do display, and I'll go into stats, uh, kurtosis test, and then I just pass through my price data frame, and then the Exxon price, and then I'll copy this. 
and then we'll do oil and then oil price and so basically what this is going to come out to is this is basically telling me that it's saying with relatively high confidence that there is some kurtosis but the problem is it's not telling me to the degree of which strength so just because it's telling me there's kurtosis does not necessarily mean it's significant kurtosis that's the important part to understand in fact as you pass through more data and so basically as your sample size gets larger and larger the likelihood that there's kurtosis and skew increases but it's not telling you to the degree of which level of kurtosis or skew there is it's just simply saying there's kurtosis and there's skew but it's not going to say to the magnitude so when you perform these tests you've got to take it with a grain of salt usually you would use it with maybe a smaller data set or something along that nature but when you start getting into larger and larger data sets a lot of times you can actually, uh, it, the likelihood that there is skew or something like that, it's going to increase pretty dramatically. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and then with this one, what we'll do is we'll do the skew test. <clears throat> and so what we'll do is skew test. And then skew test. And it's going to basically tell us the same result. It, it's saying there's really, I mean, it's basically saying there's skew and their skew, which we know their skew, but it's not telling me to the magnitude of which uh, skew it's at. So again, we just have to keep this in mind. When we do these tests, it will kind of validate and tell us there's kurtosis or there's skew, but it's not going to tell me the magnitude of it. So that's why it's important to understand the magnitude of it, um, because sometimes it's within normal ranges and it's completely fine to go forward. Um, it's kind of when it's getting to those more excessive levels and we have to go like, wait a minute, we probably should do something. And the only one that kind of was at that level was the oil skew. And so with this one, it was kind of at that cutoff point where it's like, okay, you know, if I was maybe being a little bit more conservative, I would probably do a transformation or something along that nature. So with that being said, I am going to finish this particular video. Uh, so again, if you have any questions about skew, kurtosis, you know, the describe method, correlation, or just plotting, you know, please put them down in the comments below. In our next video, we're actually going to build the model. And so we're going to actually fit the data to the model. And then we're going to evaluate our model um, in the last video or something like that. Or I think it's going to be like three more videos. So thanks again for watching, guys. And we'll see you in the next video.